continue this evening the account of Jesus' passion from the book of Luke. We pick up at verse 20 of chapter 20. You might recall from the last section that the Sanhedrin came to Jesus trying to undermine his authority with the people, asking where his authority was from, and Jesus flipped a table on them and showed them that they lacked authority. Uh, this evening, we'll see how they continue in different ways to try to undermine Jesus and how he thwarts them, showing who he is and his love for us sinners. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of governor. And they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do, no show, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Here we see after the Sanhedrin, the leaders of Israel have failed, they try a different way. They try to join, a, join him and then stab him in the back. They send people that they hope Jesus won't recognize are from them, some lackeys. And these Pharisees come to Jesus and pretend to be devoted followers, to be really interested in what he says, to acknowledge that everything you say is true and that you would never do anything wrong. And after trying to butter him up with that, they come to the question that they hope to trip him up in. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Why was this such a hot issue? Well, because many in Israel thought that the Romans were ungodly pigs that no righteous Israelite should be paying taxes to. And so after buttering up Jesus, they are expecting that he will say, no, it's not lawful to pay taxes to Caesar. And then these people plan to turn him over to Pilate. Oh, this person is, is causing insurrection. And then they're hoping that Pilate will take care of him. Well, what is Jesus' answer? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer and kept silent. They thought they had this foolproof way to get Jesus in trouble, and he turns the table on them and gets them in trouble. He gets them to see that they were wrong with this answer that has become famous, even for people who aren't Christians. They know this quote, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. And he does it such in a masterful way to get them to see what is wrong. He asked them to pull out this coin. And they had readily available. This is the money that they had. And they all had one. And they show it to him. And thus show their own hypocrisy. Yes, they denounced Rome. And yet they were using all the stuff that Rome had brought them that made their lives easier. They used the roads that Rome had built. They used the coinage that Rome had made. All those benefits from living in the Roman society, they were using them and then claiming that they didn't owe taxes. You know, that's like someone saying here in America that they shouldn't pay taxes and yet using the roads that taxes are paid for. And so Jesus, by showing them that they all had these coins, is showing them that they're using this stuff that Rome provides and yet denouncing that they should pay something for this. Showing them that they're hypocrites. But he's doing more than just that. He's showing them that these things are not contrary. That they should pay taxes to a government, even if it was pagan, even if it was cruel, even if it was unfair. They had been put under that Roman government by God. And they should give to Caesar or to the government the things that were due to government. And a lesson to us, too. Because we might sympathize with these people in the last verse. These people asking, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? Because oftentimes our government does things that we dislike. Things that are unchristians. 
And while, of course, we don't support things that are unchristians, God tells us to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. And what is due him? Respect and taxes and honor and our prayers. Doing that does not exclude us from giving to God the things that are God. And what things are due God? Our worship and our praise and our thanks all our life. Yes, the Romans had given them things like coinage, which made commerce, which helped Judah become a more wealthy nation, and, and roads, and kept them safe from bandits with their, with their troops, and gave them a, opened a whole empire for, for the things that they made there to be shipped and sold. What had God given them? Something far more than Rome could have. God has given us all heaven in his Son. The son who is right here is trying to get these people to see that they can't trick him. But more importantly, why are they trying to trick him? It's not because there was anything unrighteous in him, but because there was something unrighteous in them. They who needed a savior. And he was there, willing, wanting to be their savior. If they would just let him. But they are not. Now the Sadducees want to turn. Verse 27. And some of the Sadducees who denied that their resurrection came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children, and the second took her as a wife, and he died childless. And then the third took her in the like manner, the seventh also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as a wife. So these lackeys of the Pharisees, they had their chance to try and, and undermine Jesus. And now the Sadducees are taking a chance. Remember, this is a different political party. Uh, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They didn't believe in a lot of things. And they were generally the opponents of the Pharisees. And they come to Jesus with this, what they think is a humdinger of a question. A question that they had been probably proposing before. Oh, you Pharisees, you believe in the resurrection of the dead? And you believe that, well, Moses said that, you know, if, if uh, a man's wife dies, that his brother should marry him. Well, then tell me this. Whose wife will they be in the resurrection? They thought that this showed the absurdity of the resurrection. And they thought that they could use this on Jesus to show... Now, there's no resurrection from the dead and that they could make Jesus look bad and the Pharisees as well. well what is Jesus' answer? And Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die anymore, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. The mistake that these Sadducees made was, well, many, but one of the big ones was that they were assuming that the age to come, how Jesus refers to the age when this sinful world is done away with and a new heaven and earth are brought forth and all those who believe in Jesus come to that new era, that that won't be like this present world. There won't be children being born there won't be people getting married and, and being given in marriage, and people will live forever. So that was one of the mistakes they were making with this question. But there was a bigger issue here that Jesus really addresses. You know, he says to them, you don't even understand what is, is going to be like. That's why you think this, this question you propose is a problem. It's no problem whatsoever. But the bigger issue here that he addresses is the is the Sadducees not believing in the resurrection of the dead. And so he continues, But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Egypt, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Some, then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. You know, there's other passages that 
that talks about Jesus being God of the living. But the, the thing about the Sadducees is they, they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so Jesus points to a passage from those books, showing them, yes, God did teach the resurrection of the dead. The, Sadducees, the, sorry, the Sadducees thought that was ridiculous and claimed God had never taught that, and Jesus takes this opportunity to show them he did. He did it even in those first five books. God says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though they were long dead. He doesn't say, I was their God. He says, I am. And the Sadducees, who is sought to, to silence Jesus, are silenced. And we are comforted. We were just talking about death and going to be with our Lord when, our, when we die and what happens to our loved ones when they pass away. And Jesus here is letting us know. You can fill in the name of your loved ones who knew Jesus here. When he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, you can fill in, and the God of... Not he was the God of, but he is, because they are alive. They are with the Lord, yes. Their body is in the ground, but their soul is with the Lord. And how could this be? Because our God is great. And because Jesus here on Tuesday of Holy Week, all this is happening on Tuesday week, in a few days, he will go to death because these people would not accept him as their savior, but rather would crucify him. He would go to death for their sin and our sin to forgive us so that he can be our God, the God of us who live. Continue in verse 40. But after that, they dared not question him anymore. And he said to them, how can they say that Christ is the son of David? Now David himself said in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Then David calls him Lord. How is he then his son? You know, um, for many years of my life, I found this very confusing. Not because it's confusing how David calls his savior Lord. That always made sense to me. I always, when I was much younger, I always used to be like, how is that confusing to the Jews? You know, Jesus poses this question to them, and they're like, oh, I don't get it. I was like, how's that hard to understand? David is prophesying about a savior to come, and he calls him my Lord. But that really stumped the Jews. Are you confused too? Why would that stump them? And the reason that would stop them is because they thought that the Savior that God had promised throughout the Old Testament, they thought that that person would just be man. Just a man. Sure, a great man. Sure, you know, a mighty warrior, perhaps like David, but still just a man. And so they didn't see that that person would be God. And so that's why they couldn't understand why David would address this, this descendant of his as his Lord. They thought it would just be a human. That is not, of course, what David saw. David, through faith, saw that the Savior to come wouldn't just be a great and mighty warrior. David's faith that this descendant of his would be something better than David. He would be God become man. And that's what was standing before these people and standing before us in the gospel. Posing this question to them, they thought that they could trick him. Jesus now asks them a question. For this purpose, to get them to see how blind they are. How could they not understand why David would call this future Savior, this Messiah, his Lord? And they look at this, what he says. And they're like, oh man, how does he call him Lord? And they should have come up with the answer. Because this promised Savior is God. But they would not believe that. And they would not believe that Jesus was that God. And so they do not understand. And so Jesus talks about them. 
Then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplace, in the best seats in the synagogues, in the best places at feasts, who devour widow houses and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. You know, it's these, these scribes, these, these lawyers, these, these rulers of Israel. They were in charge of seeing to the administration of, of the legal affairs of widows who had, who had no uh, husband to see to their legal affairs. They were in charge of that. And they were in charge of seeing to orphans. And yet, as Jesus points out, these people devoured widows' homes. You know, they made a big pretense of it being legal. But they took those homes from the widows, totally abusing and misusing their power to gain more wealth for themselves. And yet the whole time, even while they're doing this despicable thing, they're making themselves look really good with beautiful, beautiful garments that make people look at them and go, wow, that person's really glorious looking. And then these great and elaborate prayers and going to the temple, as we're going to see in the next few verses, and giving these large offerings to the Lord. Hypocrites! Jesus calls them out to the disciples and to us. Don't be like those hypocrites who are doing these awful things and yet are trying to hide it from themselves and from others by these glorious clothes and these grand gestures. And he's saying it to us too. That we should beware of hypocrisy, of us doing terrible things, of us being a terrible employee, of us being terrible citizens and neighbors and spouses and children and parents, and then coming and making these elaborate gestures to God and talking the big talk and under, for a pretense talking about all these things we've done for God as a show. God says these will receive greater condemnation. Indeed, we should receive great condemnation for our hypocrisy. And yet we turn here tonight, and as we approach Jesus' death to see him stricken, smitten, and afflicted, him receiving the greater condemnation. These, these scribes and Pharisees, they will have it worse on the day of judgment because they rejected Jesus. But we know that we should receive great condemnation. We see it put upon Jesus. So put away the hypocrisy. Put away making ourselves trying to look like great Christians by pretense. Serve the Lord in humility, love truth, and mercy. And Jesus points to something else that we should be like here in the next verses. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasure, and he saw a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. This follows right on the heels of Jesus pointing out the hypocrisy of the Pharisees. And here's another example. They had, as you can see in these pictures, these trumpet-shaped fixtures that went into those boxes, and they had, uh, what was it, like 13 of them? Um, in the courtyard of the temple. And the people were to come in there to put any offerings they had for the temple and the, and the yearly temple tax to throw in, into that. And all these people, all these rich people came in and made this big pretense uh, so that everyone would see them of all this money they're putting in there. And here's this poor widow who probably felt embarrassed, probably didn't want anyone to see her because she had such a pitiful offering, not even worth two cents. And yet she gives it. And yet we're reminded, as God told Samuel when he was looking for the king of Israel, he says, don't look as man looks. Man looks at the outward. God looks at the heart. And so Jesus, looking at all these people, he knew what was in their hearts. That many of these rich people, it was nothing to them to give these big offerings because they had plenty. It was no sacrifice at all on their part. And in fact... It got them something. They were 
not only was it not hurtful or not a sacrifice to give, for them to give this large amount of money because they had so much, but also they're getting all this glory from their fellow human beings. Oh, wow, look, that person's so great. But Jesus looks at the heart. And he saw the sacrifice this woman made and saw why she's giving this. Not only is she giving far more than she could afford all that she had so that, you know, she would have to worry what she would eat that day and the next. But she is also doing it with a heart of thanks to her God. She wants to support the Lord's work and show her thanks. And so she gives this, this piddly amount. And yet God says it's worth more to him than all the great amounts that were given by those before her. He points this to the disciples to this and points us to it. So we should ask ourselves tonight, what can make our gifts to the Lord small and what can make our gifts big? No matter how much we give to the Lord, it looks very small. If we're just giving it because we feel we have to and not a cheerful giver, as we talked about with the kids a few weeks ago. What else can make our offerings small to the Lord? If it's not a sacrifice on our part at all, like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I got, I had plenty. Oh, here's some left over. I don't need it. No how matter much we're throwing into the plate like that. To the Lord's eye who sees our heart, it is small. But what can make our gifts big? Big to the Lord, no matter if we're giving two mites or two million. What can make our gifts big to the Lord is if we give like this woman. Or like Mary Magdalene, who bought that precious ointment and put it on Jesus' feet. She knew that Jesus was going to, for, going to death for her, a sinner. That's what makes our gifts big, whether it's two mites or two million when it's given in love and faith in our Savior, when it's a sacrifice on our part, not when it's easy to get because we won't miss it, but in love for the Lord, we're giving beyond, beyond what is easy, beyond what is just extra. It's a sacrifice. Whether it's two mites or two million, a sacrifice the Lord sees sees what's in our heart and that is a big gift to the Lord no it doesn't make us as as we had earlier tonight worthy to come to the age that is to come what makes us worthy to come to the age to come is faith in our savior who washed us and loved us and gave himself for us but Jesus sees a heart filled with that faith that gives a sacrifice that gives in faith And he loves it, and he blesses it. So as we contemplate this Lent, what our Lord gave for us, the sacrifice he made for us, we also contemplate, am I sacrificing for him? Or am I being like the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Giving what is easy. Giving for the glory. Giving so because it makes me feel good about myself, like I've earned something. The Lord, forgive us for when we give for the wrong reasons. May he give us a heart that joyfully gives to him, our Savior. Amen. Continue with singing hymn 151, verses 1, 2, 6, and 7.